Words uttered from one's last breaths create meaning that outlives the person speaking them. Many don't consider their final moments until they look death in the face, but Jesus did. Every word he spoke brings us new life, but none greater than in his final breaths. As he hung there on the cross, tortured, dying, struggling for air and barely able to breathe, Jesus didn't hang in silence. He spoke to those around him, strangers, family, friends. Today from the cross, Jesus is speaking to you and me. Good morning, church family. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that as a gift from us to you. You can keep that, mark it up. It is yours now. As we continue our walk through uh, the seven sayings of Christ from the cross. The cross is so commonplace in our culture that it's lost its ability to offend, right? It's, It's jewelry, it is decoration. It's a symbol of religious beauty. But in the ancient world, it was an abomination, a brutal means of execution and torture, a symbol of agony. There's nothing beautiful about it, right? Roman citizens could not be crucified. Even the word cruz was a swear word You would not use it in polite company. Cicero said it is impossible to find the word for such an abomination. Crucifixion was only reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. Those that you wanted to plumb the depths of disgrace become a subhuman category. When Luke tells us that there are two other uh, criminals that are crucified to either side of Jesus, right? It is safe to assume that they endured much of the same process that Jesus did. Now, as we walk through the seven sayings of Christ from the cross, it's important for us to remember the events from last week. Because Jesus suffered mightily. You remember he was scorched, right? He was beaten within an inch of his life. He was forced to carry his cross. But due to not only the scourging, but the additional, the waves of beating that he endured, he he was not physically able, he collapsed in the process. Atop Golgotha, he is stripped naked, stretched out across the beam as nine-inch nails are driven through each wrist, and then one through two feet overlapped. They cast lots for his clothes as they mock him, reject him, taunt him. If you are the Messiah, like you've claimed all along, save yourself. (laughs) Then we will believe. Unwittingly, they echo a thousand-year-old prophecy from Psalm 22, 6 through 8. But I am a worm and not a man a reproach of men and despised by the people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip. They wag the head saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Well, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. See, ironically, they taunt the king of kings and they mock him as king. 
placing a crown of thorns upon his head and drape him in a purple robe. Pilate writes the official charges in a sign above his head that reads, this is the king of the Jews. Now the written charges only caused the crowd to taunt him all the more. Well, since you are the king, they sarcastically offer him bitter wine because it was a drink for royalty. And they laugh. But unwittingly, they are fulfilling Psalm 69, verse 21, that they offer me gall to drink. And what is his response? To all this abuse, Jesus' first words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as we saw last week, that, that was a prayer of unmatched glory. And this morning, we are about to see the effects of that very prayer. So listen as we pick up in Luke 23. We'll begin on verses 39 and 40. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, there is no God like you. You are the creator of the universe. You spoke everything into being. You reign above it all. You are sovereign. You are in control. And your plan of salvation and redemption was through sending your son to be crucified on our behalf. Oh, the depths of the glory of the cross of Christ. Holy Spirit, this morning, we pray through your word, through reading your text, God, that you have revealed yourself, you have revealed your son to us most magnificently through the narration of the cross, that we would understand the depths of the gospel, oh, a bit more this morning. And Father, if there is anyone under the sound of my voice, that does not know you. Father, would you give them faith? Would you give them eyes to see, to know that you are a saving God, that there is no God like you who draws near to us in the midst of our absolute depravity. You are a saving God. We pray this morning that you would save, that you would save still, that you would continue to save, and we would rejoice immensely in your salvation, each of us tasting and seeing your magnificence. We pray all of that in Jesus' name, amen. Of all the criminals, on all the crosses, on all the hillsides in the vast Roman Empire, on all the days, he was crucified next to Jesus. What an opportunity, a divine appointment as we will see, and yet this criminal looked for one last opportunity to scorn Jesus. 
at least I'm not this guy. Barabbas was set to be crucified for insurrection and murder. Now, it is possible that these other two criminals were involved in the same crime, at least of similar magnitude. And as he hangs in unbearable pain, hours from his death, he summons up the strength to push up off of his feet and to speak. And what comes out is, is actually the most bitter taunt of any of those hurling abuses at Jesus. Are you not the Christ? In the Greek, it is phrased so that it assumes the positive answer. And it is dripping with sarcastic disrespect, right? Laughing, hey, 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 I know that you are the Christ. <laughs> so why don't you save yourself and me too while you're at it? Even a crucified, dying criminal takes a dig. The righteous one dies while being taunted by the unrighteous. Save yourself, they sarcastically plea over and over again. But, but that's like mocking the Passover lamb as you slit its throat. Here is a man less than six hours from slipping into eternity, from facing his holy creator, from everything he's ever done in his entire life, being on full display, that which is hidden, all of it coming to life before the eternal one, and he chooses to mock another. At least I'm not as bad as this guy. Friend, do you understand the deceitfulness of the human heart to always find someone worse than you to justify yourself? <clears throat> to always presume upon the kindness of God, right? And for this guy, even if he... Maybe there is or isn't a God, but if there is, he's drawing the line so that he's always on the superior side, so that he always comes out the better. Now, I've shared this illustration with you guys before. <clears throat> it's a true event, but it's, it's such a good confession of the heart. So, I used to be a, a professor at Wayland Baptist University, and I, I would teach intro classes, and one class, we were there, and uh, Wayland had a lot of soccer players, and there was this one young lady who was uh, from England, and uh, she, she was very outspoken, and she would engage with me while we were in class, and so one, one day I'm asking the question, what must you do to be saved? How do you get saved? And she says, well, be a good person. Now, I always press that answer, right? If you say, be a good person, I'm like, look, you got to define that. You need to know how this actually works. So <clears throat> I turn around and write on the board, be a good person. And then I start to say, well, well what does that actually mean to be a good person? And whatever she says, I will write down, right? Write it on the board. Because inevitably, right, when, when people say, well, we'll go to church, that means being a good person, I'm like, well, well, how does that work? Like, what's the percentage you have to have in order to be a good person? You gotta have 70%? Per like, is that how it works? Like, <clears throat> you just realize people are making up statistics, right? It's very vague thought out. They haven't really thought about it. So I'm writing all this on the board, and, and then I press her. And so at one point she says, well, you gotta read your Bible. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, how often do you have to read your Bible, right? In order to be good, in order to go to heaven? And her reply was, 
Well, I hope once a week, because I've just started reading it once a week for this class. <laughs> now that is revealing of the heart. To draw the line as long as I'm on the side of good. That is if to say, look, I don't actually know how it works, but I'm pretty sure where the line is, I'm on the good side. <clears throat> Here hangs pawn scum of a criminal. And he is doing everything he can to not think about the fact he's about to come face to face with God. There is no fear of God. No conscience. He once had a conscience, but it has been completely seared. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. But he doesn't want to think about that at all. And so instead he makes fun of Jesus. And in reply, Jesus doesn't utter a sound. No warning, no retort, silence. And suddenly a lone voice of clarity in the midst of endless waves of demonic abuse, hangs one who rebukes and comes to Jesus' defense. Do you not fear God? It is to declare him a fool. Right? Only a fool would mock another while you face death. Verse 41, and the other criminal says, and we indeed are suffering justly, for we have received what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Of all the criminals, on all the crosses, on all the hillsides in the vast Roman Empire, on all the days he was crucified next to Jesus. In complete contrast to the rejecting crowd, to the mocking Jewish leaders, to the scoffing Roman guards, and to the sarcastic criminal crucified on the other side of Jesus, for just an instant, there is moral clarity. Now imagine with me this criminal's final days. Church history tells us that his name is Dismas. The pronouncement of death looms over him. Every hour as he sits in his cell, Counting down the time, three days, two days, one day. His sister pops by with a tearful goodbye. His mom and dad would not come. He has brought too much shame upon the family. Dismas, deservedly so, will die alone. He deservedly will carry his cross in the shame of his sin. He deservedly will be scorched and he deservedly will hang for his sins. And as the time draws near, his conscience begins to pound him. He knows he's about to come face to face with God Almighty. And he knows he stands condemned. You see, this criminal actually has a distinct advantage over most because he knows he's a sinner who's fallen short of the glory of God. Let me quote for us Kent Hugh because it's incredibly powerful. 
Most people live in a foggy world of ambiguity and relativism, falling in love with the dark contours of their lives, convincing themselves that their sins are noble and glorious, that their pride is dignity, and that their unwillingness to forgive is just high moral character. No such haze clouded this man's soul. He knew, he knew that his sins were an offense to God. He knew that he was spiritually dead. And his day finally came. And to his expectation, the pain screamed worse than he imagined. And the shame pierced deeper than he thought possible. And the fear of God grew ominously. You see, but of all the criminals, on all the crosses, and all the hillsides, and the vast Roman Empire, on all of the days, Dismas was crucified next to Jesus. And he had seen the way that the guards taunted him with that crown of thorns and that purple robe. He had witnessed the extra intensity and duration of the scourging that he endured. And then as crucified, he heard as the crowd endlessly rained down scorns upon him, King! Save yourself. But to that, Jesus responded with a prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, that prayer pierced Decimus' soul. Instantly, like a crack that just begins and continues to grow. Those words bounced around his mind endlessly over and over again. And everything else was shut out and became silent. It began with, what sort of righteous man is hanging next to me? Clearly, he is innocent of all real crimes. But what sort of innocent man responds like this? They mock him as Messiah. He is Messiah. And did he not say, Father, forgive them? He petitions God as his very own Father. He calls God Father and then uses that relationship to petition for forgiveness. How can that be? to the very ones that are mocking him, to the very ones that are crucifying and killing him. They know that he is innocent, and yet they kill him, and yet they taunt him. And in the midst of that, he petitions his father for their forgiveness. You see, he's connecting all the dots. He's piecing it together. The Spirit of God is illuminating his mind. And then when one of the other's criminals chimes in, he's had enough, he must step in, and he rebukes him. Do you not fear God? You fool. Do you not fear God? But you see, it's all been building for Decimus. It's been, it's been building towards this very moment, a moment of Request. Look at verse 42. Jesus, remember me when you come 
in your kingdom. Jesus. Did you know this is the only account in all four gospels where Jesus is addressed by name? You say, yeah, that can't be. It is. Jesus is always addressed as teacher or master, only here. Now, how tender and absolutely personal is that? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I must confess to you guys that that I've always uh, assumed I knew what he was saying here. And I've completely missed it, all right? So if you're anything like me, I've assumed that the criminal was asking Jesus, hey, basically, when you get to heaven, can I be there? And that actually misses it. Listen to what he says. He says, when you come in your kingdom, as in when you come again, right? This is messianic language about the Messiah ruling in Jerusalem and restoring Israel. This is messianic language of Jesus returning as the exalted king, returning with his righteous ones to reign. So hanging there, this thief actually speaks of the second coming. So picture the scene, because talk about what faith, right? Is he the first to get a glimpse? I'm not seeing he's pieced all of it together. But is he the first to get a glimpse? Because he is pointing to the resurrection and the second coming. That's what he sees Because right next to him hangs a crucified Messiah that is marred beyond recognition. And he says, when you come in your kingdom. Now, catch the request. Because he says, when you come in your kingdom, ruling and reigning in power in your kingdom, and with you comes all the righteous ones, could you remember me? Jesus, could I be one of the righteous ones that comes with you? Could I be one of your righteous, you petition your father on behalf of them for forgiveness. Could I be counted among your righteous? Now, what a scene. Because picture this, it is scandalous. He is the picture of depravity. He is the epitome of wickedness and sin. Every parent who walks by tells their child, you see him. He is everything that God hates. He is getting what he deserves on this side, and we are sending him to God where he will be punished for all of eternity for his sins. And knowing this, Here is his outrageous plea of faith. Jesus, you are my only hope. Okay, you think he's at the end? You think there are any other options? Jesus, you are my only hope. Could I be counted among the righteous when you come? And for the first time in probably an hour, Jesus speaks. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yes, you can. 
Yes, you can. All right, I'm going to unfold what Jesus said here, but listen to me. He answers him, yes, you can be one of my righteous. All right, so what does Jesus say here? Do you guys remember in John chapter 11 when Lazarus dies and then Jesus delays his coming for two days? And then he shows up and Lazarus has been dead for four days. So in John chapter 11, Martha meets Jesus on the road and she is angry and she is confused and she rushes out to meet Jesus. And Jesus looks at her and says, your brother will rise again. And she says, yeah, I know at the end, at the resurrection, at the end. Yeah, I know that, right? So at that moment, even though there's resurrection at the very end, it provides minimal hope for and comfort for Martha, right? She's like, I'm here, I'm now, I'm in pain, and that is so far off, it only, it, it's, it's minimal, and then it's like, it's like Jesus lifts her heads and says, look at me, listen. Then he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Martha, you don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Meaning, Martha... Lazarus is alive now. Okay, he's alive now. He's more than alive now than he's ever been. And just to prove it, he walks over to the grave and resurrects him and says, see, there he is. I told you, he's alive. Okay? Because, so, right, one day the newspapers will read Pastor Jason, wife, or husband, his wife, Lane, and three kids is dead. But don't you believe that for one second? Because I will be more alive than right now before you. It's one of my favorite passages to preach at a funeral, right? He's alive now. So when you place your faith in Jesus, you are eternally alive from that moment. So, Back to our text, all right? That jump that Jesus just made. All right, so when Dismas, our crucified criminal, asked Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom, right? That's at the end, okay? Remember me then. That jump is what Jesus does here because he says to him, Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, just on the other side of death's door, you will find eternal life. So here, I, I, the, <coughs> the picture of the most gruesome, tortured death is the promise of paradise, heaven, goodness for all of eternity, just on the other side. And how did he get it? Simply by a single act of faith. A question that came at the end of, of his thinking and his repentance, of his acknowledgement of sin. A question of hope. Could you remember me? Could I be account, counted among your righteous? Jesus, is there grace enough for even me? And the resounding answer is yes, dismiss. Yes, there is grace for you. Yes, I will not just remember you then. I will save you now. Guys, God is too good. All right? It is too wonderful. It is too astounding to comprehend. Catch this entire scene. 
because he has been hanging there for hours now amongst scores and taunts of save yourself, save yourself. If you are the king, save yourself. Prove to us that you are the promised one of God. And they scorn him and they mock him for not saving. All the while, there is Jesus saving. The one next to him as he becomes the curse of his sin for the very one right next to him. Isn't that a masterpiece of God? Isn't God orchestrating the entirety, the whole of it, and putting his own glory on display that God would rather be glorified for dying to the criminal next to him than for tearing off the cross like he's Hulk and just being like, ah, oh, look at how powerful I am. He would rather be glorified by laying down his life for the criminal next to him. Today, you will be with me in paradise. It will only be hours now. The leaders will want to speed up the process and go through and break every criminal's legs and within seconds, dismiss will suffocate. But on the other side, on the other side of that door, what did Jesus promise? Himself. Himself. You will be with me. Can you imagine all that splendor? What is it going to be like? And our boy Dismas is going to be there. How do you comprehend that? Covered by the blood of Christ, counted as if he were as righteous as Jesus. Is there any more clear picture of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone? You see, of all the criminals, on all the crosses, on all the hillsides in the vast Roman Empire, on all the days, Dismas was crucified next to Jesus. He was the luckiest man to ever live. What about you? Because of all the days of your life, and all the trials and seasons that you have gone through and have shaped you, and of all the messages you heard, here you sit, an hour nearer to death. Friend, do you fear God? Does your heart acknowledge that you sin and fall short of the glory of God? Or does your heart always say, well, at least I'm better than him or her? Friend, you will not be compared to him or her. Rather, you will be compared to God Almighty, to him and to him alone. And you are dead in your sin. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever, that means you, that whosoever believes in him, that simply by believing in him, you would not perish for your sins, 
but instead he would gift you eternal life. And here you've sat under the message of God's hope. This is God's message. This is God's, God has preserved it so that we might scour it, so that we might piece all of this together. This is the good news of the gospel. And the question is, are you humble enough to reckon that you are equal with that crucified criminal and your only hope is to turn to Jesus and say, would you remember me when you come in your kingdom? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, right now, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that does not know you, Father, if they are trusting in their own goodness, in their own works, Father, show them, reveal to them that it all falls short, that their only hope, that their only grace is to look to you, to cast all of their hope on you, all of their faith, for by faith alone in your grace we are saved. Father, right now in Jesus' name, save. Save. Give saving faith. And those of us that know you, we rejoice in your goodness. It is too good for us to comprehend. You are so poetic. You are so moving. You you have orchestrated from eternity past the revelation of yourself. How could there ever be a God like you? who would rather save the criminal next to him than come down off that cross. Glory. Glory to your name. There is no God like Jesus. There is no king like him. We worship you. We bow before you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, as the praise team comes and leads us in one final song, this is your chance to respond to God's word. I pray that the Spirit of God has stirred you and moved you, and now you respond. Most of the time, you you should have been clutching the back of your seat going, yeah, I can't wait to sing hallelujah for the goodness of our Savior, right? Amen? When you think about the depths that he did go through for your sin, so here is your chance. Most of us are going to stand and sing. We'll have ministers down here at the front who would love to pray with you. If that's a praise, if that's a hallelujah, awesome. If it's a prayer request, don't carry that on your own. We would love to walk alongside you and to comfort you and to be a family in the midst of the hurt and confusion. Whatever it is, as the Spirit of God has moved, would you stand and would you respond to Him?